Good day. We are a group of Stellenbosch University first year health science students and today we are going to be conducting a general abdominal examination. Remember, this is only part of the consultation, which generally consists of greeting and meet. Taking of a history, the physical examination followed by Discussion of the diagnosis and treatment and if necessary a follow-up. One, two, three. Splish, splash, I was taking a bath. Long about a Saturday night. The tub, I put my feet on the floor. I wrap the towel around me and I open the door. And in a splish splash, I jump back in the bath. Well, how was I to know there was a party going on? Hello, my name is Ingrid. Hi, I'm Nika. Please have a seat. All right. So the first thing we will be looking at is the patient's skin for any pigmentation or discoloration. So as you can see, the skin looks very normal. There's no signs of pallor, flushing, or redness. And then if you could please give me your hand. Okay, so the next thing I will be checking is for elasticity, turgor, and hydration. So um, I can pick up a small fold of the hand and let it go. So I can see it drops back immediately. So there's no signs of dehydration and elasticity looks normal. So if you can turn over the palm of the hand, there's no palmar erythema. And as I can touch the hand, I feel the temperature is normal. So then the next thing we can look at in our patient is the eyes for the first two letters of the abbreviation JACL for jaundice and anemia. So if I can lower the eyelids with my thumbs, I can look at the sclera and bulbar conjunctiva. There are no signs of yellow discoloration of the sclera, so there's no jaundice, um, and the conjunctiva are not too pale, so there's no anemia. And if you can give me your hand, please. We can also check the palms of the hands for jaundice, so there's no yellow discoloration here, or the soles of the feet. And then we'll be checking the third letter of the jackal, the C, for clubbing. And we can do the Shamroth test to check for the angle between the nail bed and the nail. See if you can hold your nail starting with the thumbs, like this, each finger. So you see the nice diamond Let's between the nail. The and yeah. then I can also hold the nails up, fingers up to my eye level, to check for the angle between the nail and the finger. Hand. So then there's no signs of clubbing. And the next thing we will be checking is the hands and the nails. Give me a hand, please. Blue nails for peripheral cyanosis, red nails, polycythemia, white nails, or leukinechia, which is caused by hyperalbuminemia, or pale nail beds, which is caused by anemia, which we've looked at. Um, and then coilinechia, or spoon-shaped nails, which is caused by iron deficiency anemia. And then the last one is splinter hemorrhages, which can be caused by infective endocarditis or trauma. So Nika's nails look perfectly normal, um, no signs of any nail changes. And I'll be doing the next part of the general examination. Nika, do you mind if I test you for the cyanosis test? No, not at all. So can you please stick out your tongue for me? Stick it out. Okay, now move it from side <laughs> to side. Up against your palate. Your lips also don't seem to be blue, so I see no signs of central cyanosis. The corners of your, of your mouth I see are also not inflamed, so therefore there is also no angular stomatitis um, present, so there you are fine. Can I have a look at your hands? Okay, so we see on the hands that there are no um, blue discolorations, so therefore no, vas uh, no vasoconstrictions peripheral peripherally, so therefore we can say there's no peripheral um, cyanosis either. So next I'll be checking for pitting edema. I'll be using my two fingers to press against your tibia and making an indentation. If it takes longer than five seconds to refill, then that might be an indication for you to have pissing you. In this case, your left leg is fine. Just have to check your right leg. That's in order. You do not have any. Okay, so next, I'll be testing Nika for uh, lymph lymph adenopathy. Is that right? If I palpate your lymph nodes. Okay, so we're going to be starting with the post auricular lymph nodes behind the ear. It seems to be fine. Now the pre-auricular lymph nodes, um, your epitrochlear lymph nodes, just here by your bicep, they don't seem to be inflamed. Next your axillary lymph nodes, okay, that's in order. now we move up to your head region, your occipital lymph nodes, that's fine. So next we 
feel the tonsillar lymph nodes. That seems to be in order. Moving down to the submandibular. That's okay. Submental under the chin. That's alright as well. Okay, so behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle, um, you find the post cervical chain lymph nodes. Okay, that's fine. Now, those ones before, it's the pre cervical chain lymph nodes. That's okay. And then, Nika, this might hurt a little bit. Sorry. This might hurt a little bit. Um, but I'm going to be palpating the deep cervical lymph nodes. Right. Now, lastly, we palpate there. Supraclavicular lymph nodes. It seems as if everything is in order. I will be illustrating the four quadrants of the abdomen for an abdominal inspection. But in order to do that, we first need to make sure that our patient is lying horizontally under good lighting with its head supported by one pillow. Abdomen exposed, and would you please place your arms on the side of you? The four quadrants of the abdomen can be marginalized by the mid sternal line passing through the umbilicus and a horizontal line also passing through the umbilicus which separates it into the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, the right lower quadrant and the left lower quadrant. Penix is situated in the right lower quadrant. It is where you find McBurney's point. It is marginalized by the junction of the medial and lateral thirds of an imaginary line passing from the right anterior superior iliac spine to the umbilicus. One, two, three, where those two thirds meet, would where you'd find the McManus point. I'm going to explain the nine quadrants of the abdomen. Okay, so first we start with the vertical lines. Those lines are called the midclavicular lines and they are further subdivided by two horizontal lines, namely the transpyloric line and the transtubercular line. The transpyloric line lies just below the costal margin and the transtubercular line, line lies just below the umbilicus. Thus you get nine quadrants, namely the right hypochondrium, the epigastric, the left hypochondrium, the right lumbar, the umbilicus, the left lumbar, the right iliac fossa, the hypogastric, and the left iliac fossa. We'll be using the techniques of inspection, auscultation, palpation, and percussion as our compass for detecting any abnormalities. Uh, now I'm going to be doing the abdominal inspection. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. First of all, we're going to start off with the skin. So the skin is normal and it's the same color like the rest of the body. There are no areas of discoloration, redness, or rigidity of the skin. There are no visible lesions, but however, there is a scar in his right iliac fossa, which suggests that the patient has had an appendectomy. The hair distribution is normal for a male. There are no visible blood vessel dilatations. There are no signs of, there are no visible ecchymosis, nor are there no visible signs of striae. Next, we're going to be looking at the shape of the abdomen. The abdomen is nice and flat, which is normal. If the abdomen were distended, it would be because of nine possible reasons, which is fat, fluid, feces, flatus, fetus, full bladder, fibroids, filthy tumor, and phantom pregnancy. There are no visible masses on the body. Next, we're going to be looking at um, the symmetry. This, uh, the left side is symmetrical to the right side. Then also, we're going to be looking at hernias, so, for when we look at hernias, we're going to look in the umbilical region and also in the femoral region. So, we're just going to ask the patient, the patient to cough, and when he coughs, we're going to look in these two areas. Can you please cough us? <coughs> there are no visible hernias. Next, we're going to be looking at the pulsations and peristalsis. Now, we know that the aorta ends at the umbilicus, so we'll be looking for pulsations over here, so we're going to have to drop our eyes to look and we're going to ask the patient to hold in his breath. Can you please hold in the breath for us? Okay, we don't see any pulsations, which is normal. You can breathe now. Uh, we don't see any pulsations, which is normal. But if there were pulsations, it could be because of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And then also, peristalsis is not visible in most patients and only visible in really, really thin patients. Like Shafika explained, the abdomen can be divided into four quadrants 
um, by two imaginary lines and I will start my auscultation in the right lower quadrant um, because that is where the colon starts and the anatomy of the colon is the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon and sigmoid colon which is the pattern that I will follow using the diagram of my stethoscope with light pressure. Okay, starting in the right lower quadrant. So in all four quadrants, there were vowel sounds present um, with the same frequency, which is absolutely normal. Um, abnormal sounds can be hyperactive, um, which is caused by diarrhea or Corns disease, and hypoactive, caused by um, blocked blood vessels, such as a blood clots, hernias, tumors, which obstructs the bowel. And if you listen for up to three, three minutes and no sounds, it is classified as absent. Thank you. I will be doing the palpation of the abdomen, which consists of the light palpation and the deep palpation. Sir, can I please ask you whether or not your bladder is empty? Okay. Sir, can I please ask you to please breathe in slowly and deeply through your mouth. If you experience any pain, please let me know. And for reference, if any pain is expressed, I will move away from the area and leave that area for loss. So for light palpa for superficial palpation, I will be starting in the right iliac fossa, up the ascending colon, to the apetic flexure, to the transverse colon, to the splenic flexure, descending colon, sigmoid colon, suprapubic region, periumbilical region, and the epigastric region. For deep palpation, I'll be following the same route, but the palpation will be deeper, plus minus three to five centimeters deeper. I found that his abdomen is not rigid or guarding. No guarding is present, no rigidity, no tenderness. His skin temperature and texture is normal. No masses were felt and no pul abnormal palpations as well as no tender areas. Okay so next we are going to palpate the liver. Can I just ask you to sit up a little so I can identify the rectus abdominis muscles. Okay we do not palpate over these muscles. Can I just ask you to lie on my left hand? Thank you. I'm going to start in the right iliac fossa and move up in the line of the mid clavicular line towards your costal, costal margin since the liver is situated behind the right rib cage. Yeah. Okay, so can you just breathe deeply through your mouth? On inspiration, I will um, feel through your liver and on expiration, I will move my hand in a boat movement. Okay, okay so breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. Okay, so after inspiration, can you just hold your breath for me? Okay, so I could not feel the edge of the liver, which is completely normal. Um, we usually only um, feel it in very thin patients. And if you could feel it, it should be non-tender, smooth and firm. But so everything looks normal and... So now we will be palpating the spleen. To, this, to do this, I will ask the patient, patient if I can put my left hand under his left rib cage, over there. Then I will place my right hand on the right iliac fossa. Then I will start palpating by moving my hand in slow motions, only one centimeter at a time, while asking the patient if you could please inhale deeply and slowly. Or can you please? So the spleen is usually located posterior to the mid and to the left mid axillary line underneath the 11th to 9th rib. If the spleen enlarges, it enlarges inferiorly and medially towards the umbilicus. And when reaching the costal margin, I will ask the patient to exhale and hold his breath for me. Then I will pull with my left hand and with my right hand, I will palpate 
the spleen under the left costal margin. To enhance palpation, I can ask the patient to turn on his right side. This will help me to palpate the spleen under normal conditions. Okay, so we'll now be doing the percussion of the abdomen. And also, I'll just be percussing your abdomen. Starting from the right iliac fossa, I'll be working up with the ascending colon, turning at the hepatic flexure, going across the transverse colon, then turning again at the splenic flexure, and then I'll be going down with the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, working up around the peri-umbilical region and then up to the epigastric region. Okay. Resonant, resonant, hyper-resonant at the hepatic flexure, hyper-resonant, resonant, 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 hyper-resonant, hyper-resonant at the stomach. Passing for the liver span, you percuss right down the right midclavicular line, which goes around here. You start percussing from the top downwards. First you find suprasternal notch, notch go down to the angle of Louis, then you go to the second intercostal space. And you start percussing, resonant, third, resonant, fourth, resonant, fifth, resonant, sixth, dull, sounds dull, dull, right, and then you make a mark, and right there, <laughs> okay, now you start percussing from the bottom upwards, along the right midclavicular line, starting from the right iliac fossa. Resonant, 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 resonant. Down. Down. Okay, so there you can take a ruler, seven around seven. So this is consistent with the normal liver span. And an enlarged liver would be more than 7, it would be around 13, more than 13 centimeters. Okay, so we'll now be percussing for the spleen. Percussing the spleen, you start from the right iliac fossa and you move diagonally towards the right, left, towards the left hypochondrial region. Okay, listen in. Resonant, sorry. Resonant. One centimeter at a time. Resonant. 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 Okay, and because the for the spleen from the midline, auxiliary auxiliary midline towards the left midclavicular line along the costal margin. So along the ninth rib. Resonant. Resonant, 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 resonant. Okay, so on percussion of the liver span and percussion of the abdomen, we found the liver was about 7 centimeters. This is consistent with a normal liver. It's not more than 13 centimeters. And on percussion of the abdomen, everything was resonant. There was no dullness indicating fluid or any abnormalities. Thank you, patient Harith. It was a nice, it was nice to have you. You may now get dressed. Thank you, thank you very much. Splish splash, I jumped back in the bath. Well, how was I to know there was a party going on? There was a splashing and a splashing, reeling with the feeling, moving and.